Hello to everyone. Um, thanks to Ida Joe for inviting me for these three talks about French baroque music, um, and especially the one played in the Louvre in the 17th century. Two weeks ago, um, we have talked about the music that was played in the King's apartments, uh, especially chamber music and air de cour. Last week, we have seen that the sacred music, uh, as soon as it was played uh, for the king with a large audience, had to take place in other venues than the Louvre, close to the Louvre, uh, like Les Feuillants, like l'Oratoire du Louvre, or saint germain le xerrois or in great cathedrals of the kingdom, uh, like Notre Dame de Paris for the Te Deum, uh, like Saint Denis for the funerals, or um, the Cathedral of France for the coronations. So today I will probably have less music um, than last week and more images. So you will have to imagine the sounds that goes with them. I would like to talk uh, to you about the great shows uh, of the Louvre and especially the Ballet de Cour. I would like to share my screen with this image. So, this is the Louvre, and this is music from the Ballet de Cour. these things did happen. Uh, we have seen that for sacred music, uh, the large audience um, and the large teams of musicians uh, excluded the Louvre itself. Of course, in the palace, uh, we had uh, large rooms um, and large enough to organize banquets, uh, to organize, uh, to organize uh, royal audiences uh, and balls. Uh, see, for instance, the, the beautiful Salle des Cariatides uh, which is now um, uh, a place in the, in the museum with uh, antique sculptures. Um, the name of the hall comes from the four ladies you can see um, uh, in the back, uh, these four, um, four ladies sustaining the, the, the musician's gallery. In the 17th century, it was a place devoted to dance, uh, to music, to theater, and Molière played for the, with the 14 for the first time in this beautiful place. But above all, uh, this place was the symbol of the monarchy. The king appeared in it on his throne, and all the balls which uh, took place there were eminently political. Uh, when we see this picture, we can imagine that at the maximum, this Salle des Cariatides could probably host around 300 people. Um, as we have seen uh, for the religious um, services from Henry IV to Louis XIV, the royal ceremonial uh, involved more and more the courtiers for obvious reasons. Uh, being close to the king, um, looking for honors, for medals, uh, all these courtiers, especially the great princes, um, were maybe more under the control of the king. That didn't avoid uh, the rebellions. Um, in the mid-century, just after the death of Louis XIII, um, the parliament and the princes uh, tried to take the power uh, ag against the, um, the queen mother Anne d'Autriche and her uh, first minister, the Italian uh, Mazarin. And these 10 years of civil war were called la fronde. Um, during all the 17th century, more and more people around the king for the ordinary, ordinary things, the wake up, the dinner, the supper, um, the religious services, uh, but also for the entertainment. So theater, of course, uh, balls, which were very appreciated in France, 
uh, but also for more exceptional shows. In this case, there was no place right in the palace um, to be able to host a, a, a large audience. But I would like to take the, the plan we had last week. Uh, so this is the musician's gallery in the Salle des Cariatides. But yes, this plan, I showed you that Le, Le Louvre um, and Saint-Germain, Luxerrois were collected and the religious services happened mainly in Saint-Germain-Luxerrois, um, you can see uh, on the top of this image. But between these two places, you can see a place called Le Petit Bourbon. Um, this is a large hall, um, even supposed to be the largest in Paris at this time, with three to four thousand people audience. And um, it has been the place for the great political events uh, or the great royal shows. Um, on this image, you can see that, 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 that the Grand Salle of this Petit Bourbon, um, who looked like a church, was um, very, very important and probably as long as the Louvre itself. So you have to imagine this large hall totally empty as it was normally devoted to the great political meetings called Etat Généraux du Royaume. Uh, I have this picture uh, which shows one of these Etat Généraux du Royaume. Um, they are great political events uh, founded in the 14th century. Uh, and it was the meeting of the delegates of the clergy, of the nobility and of the peasants. So. Uh, it needed a very large hall to host all these people. Um, in fact, this kind of meeting happened just one in the 17th century at the beginning of Louis XIII's reign. Uh, I have also this beautiful image, it's painting uh, of 19th century, but imagining this Salle du Petit Bourbon uh, in the 17th century. Uh, and it's quite realistic uh, when, when we see this painting. Um, so this place was a symbol um, linked to the king, linked to the politics. Um, it was looking like a church, but I think it was really considered as a sacred place um, of, the, of the kingdom. When Louis XIV uh, quitted the Louvre uh, to prefer Saint-Germain, les Tuileries, uh, the Palais Royal, and then Versailles, um, this Petit Bourbon Hall became unused and it was punctually transformed to host the great performances uh, and especially theatre. For instance, Molière and Scaramouche, the Italian uh, actor, uh, were in residency in that hall uh, until its destruction in 1660. Uh, for the court performances in Paris, there were also two other places during the 17th century, the Palais Royal, and Les Tuileries. Um, I would like to show you um, this man, yes. Um, as you probably know, the French opera arrived only with Lully in 1673. So um, before, thanks to our Italian prime minister Mazarin, you can see on this picture, uh, we had in Paris some beautiful operas, uh, Italian operas by Louis Grossi. Uh, for instance, L'Orfeo uh, was created in Paris in Palais Royal uh, in 1647, and by Francesco Cavalli, um, whose Ercole Amante um, was ordered by Mazarin himself uh, for the marriage of Louis XIV uh, and played in the Salle des Tuileries. In this Italian operas, not only the recitativo, not only the Italian art of singing um, were surprising for the audience of this time, but also the machines. Um, Giacomo Torelli has been uh, one of the inventors of the theater machines, and he has been especially invited by Mazarin himself to design new ones for the Louvre to get the most wonderful special effects during the shows. 
So as on this picture, you can see um, light plays, you can see mirrors, you can see uh, apparitions uh, in the fume, you can see um, uh, settings life change, uh, you can see flying machines. So Torelli got all, um, all these magic effects with very sophisticated machines behind, under, or above the stage, but nobody could see them. So only here sometimes, but so the, 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 the effect was really fantastic for the audience of this time. And from the, um, from the 1640s, all these machines uh, quickly arrived in the theater um, but also in the main genre of this time, le ballet de cour. Ballet de cour. What is a ballet de cour? What is a ballet royal? Um, for the for the end of the 16th century, uh, the, this is the main genre at the French court. Um, it combines poetry first um, with a whole libretto, uh, which consists in poems called entrées uh, and in declaimed tributes like harangue. It combines also dance. Uh, because each poetry is done. Um, all the dancers are men or boys, so we can imagine that the transformation is also the DNA of this, quite, of this type of show. Um, we also have, of course, music, um, which is generally played by the violins uh, with the whole orchestra of strings. Um, this orchestra is called um, Les 24 Violons du Roi, uh, as, the, as the music you have heard in the two pieces you, uh, I, I make you heard before. Um, we also have vocal music uh, with reci, uh, sung by the singers of the, of the court and generally um, played with the lutes. Uh, I would like to make you hear one of them. As you can see on this original drawing, uh, musicians uh, could be on stage and could be with costumes and could play themselves uh, to accompany their singing. I uh, have another one with uh, a whole orchestra of lutes. You have probably 12 lutes 
uh, on this image on stage uh, with costumes and um, with singers, probably children. Uh, on this one, also the, um, a big orchestra uh, of lutes with a um, bass de violon uh, in the middle. Um, so musicians could be on stage. Um, so I told you the, 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 the ballet court combines poetry, dance, music, but also settings, uh, mostly painted canvas, and also extraordinary and meaningful um, costumes. Each entree was telling a little story that the, the poetry explained. And uh, we had symbols everywhere. Um, once a year for the carnival, the king could organize himself a ballet de cour. Then this ballet was called Ballet Royal. Um, as a political performance, this Ballet Royal had to take place in the Louvre, in the Petit Bourbon. Um, if I try to summarize the three periods of the Ballet de Cour, we have a first period from the beginning to the 1620s. Uh, at this time, the Ballet de Cour uh, has a story uh, which comes from mythology or tragedy. The second period, uh, from the 20s to 30s, uh, the Ballet de Cour changed. Um, it became more imaginative, uh, designed to please uh, the audience uh, to be funny, but also serious, to be creative and fantastic. Uh, the titles of these ballets uh, at this time were clearly fanciful. For instance, we have the Ballet des Hypochondriacs, uh, Ballet du Monde Renversé, of the ups Upset World, uh, Ballet des Andouilles, uh, of Silly People, um, Ballet de la Douairière de Bilbao, of the Heiress of Bilbao. So it's the, the title says that the, 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 the show will be fanciful. I would like to show some costumes from these ballets of this period, uh, because as you can see, uh, this, uh, the invention uh, is quite fantastic. So this is another image of musician on stage, Oboise for this time. Uh, oh, this is a, can a painted, painted canva um, for the settings. But here you can see costumes of this second period of the Ballet de Cour, uh, with extravagant costumes, um, people, strange people, uh, musicians on stage, but this one are maybe not so usual, um, pro probably Asian, Asian instruments. Uh, you can see um, strange characters um, with different size. Animals, animals are or children or um, uh, little men in the costumes. Um, we can find exotic people of this time, uh, special dances, um, special uh, costumes with mm, probably two or three people inside, uh, animals who are real animals or machines. Um, so all these costumes uh, show the invention of this second period of the of the ballet de cour. Um, the third period, uh, from the 30s to the 40s, um, the ballet de cour be became more political. Uh, the great shows looked like a political program. And um, for instance, Richelieu, who was the prime minister before Mazarin, um, made all these shows quite explicit. Uh, it shows uh, the titles, and it was Ballet de la Marine, uh, Ballet de la Prosperité des Armes de France. So really uh, more political. After a pause uh, during the Fronde, uh, we found uh, last period of the genre, um, very short, uh, from the 50s. And it was illustrated by the poet Isaac de Bansérade. Uh, and the ballet de cour be became a sort of synthesis of these three periods. Uh, it was political, fanciful, uh, with a lot of stories coming from the mythology. Um, the ballet de cour was danced by professionals, but mostly by courtiers. 
So this was a social art and the choreography was a symbol. Uh, the list of the dancer was eminently political. The ballet cours were bound to be ephemeral. So they were not commercial projects and they were played once or twice, uh, rarely more than that. Um, the dance music was not published, but the manuscripts we have show that um, the music was functional music made for dance with many changes uh, in the rhythm, um, many breaks. So the, the dance itself was probably closer to the pantomime than to what we can see actually uh, today for uh, Baroque dance, which is closer to the 18th century. The ballet cours was not published, but the libretto was, and also the vocal music, the récit, could be published. Um, because uh, all that uh, composed the political program. So that was uh, printed and distributed to all the audience and sent uh, in many places in the kingdom. One of these ballet cours has a special story. This is the Ballet Royal de la Nuit. I would like to talk a few words about it and make you hear first some music. Ah, this is the last picture, quite funny. Um, where is it? I'm not sure to have a, ah, maybe, uh, sorry, I, I, I made you, I made you heard the overture just before, so you already heard it. Um, so about the Ballet Royal de la Nuit, um, in 1652, uh, after 10 years of civil war, Mazarin was back to France and he decided to show that, um, to show definitely uh, that the power of the young Louis XIV couldn't be challenged anymore. So no jail, no trials. He decided to organize a Ballet Royal for Carnival 1653. A subject had been chosen, uh, the night. So Bonserrade, uh, who wrote the poems, uh, had been asked to show all the frightening universe of the night divided like the ancient Greece uh, in four sets of three hours. So the first set from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, shows the ordinary things uh, with people getting back home, uh, peasants going back from the fields, um, and all the bizarre people of this time with soldiers, with uh, homeless people um, going, uh, to the center of Paris in this time, which is La Cour des Miracles. The second set from nine to midnight uh, is the moment of the theaters, of the shows, of the, um, of the entertainment. So Venus, which, who is the, the goddess of pleasures, um, commands, and uh, all the assembly gives to Venus, um, a ball, a ballet, um, and a comedy. All that in the ballet itself. From midnight to 3 a.m., uh, the moon descends on Earth to join her lover, Andymion. So the night is without any light. Uh, and this is a time for the devil, for the monsters, for the sorceresses, uh, and a fantastic Sabbath night. From 3 to 6 a.m., this is the last part of the ballet, um, the stage appears with humors uh, and with dreams. And finally, the dawn uh, opens the final section called the Grand Ballet uh, to announce that she brings the light as every morning. But this morning, um, she, brings, she brings the most brilliant sun ever seen on Earth. And this sun is danced, of course, by Louis XIV, uh, aged of 15 years old. Um, all the princes uh, whose families fighted against the king during the Fronde uh, were dancing her, uh, around him as the planets 
around turning around the sun. The politic meaning didn't need any explanation, so um, the message was clear enough and was transmitted to every country uh, around in a few days because all the embassies attending to this show um, told they never saw anything uh, like that. So the art, the music, the dance, the costumes, uh, the invention, the machines, um, everything was fantastic. Uh, art and communication uh, were mixed at their top and today we still talk about Louis XIV as the Sun King. All the music has been uh, copied at the beginning of the 18th century by Philidor, the uh, librarian of Louis XIV, uh, but he copied only the violin part, the first violin part. So all the reconstruction, the rewriting of this uh, lost Ballet Royal de la Nuit, uh, the long project to, to, to long project to bring to bring it on stage uh, in the 21st century uh, is another story. Uh, we did it um, we did it with correspondence in 2017 um, in the Théâtre de Caen, Versailles and Dijon. Uh, I think it has been a wonderful experience for all the musicians, uh, like finding um, a treasure on a desert island but um, hopefully we'll play it again next October in Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris, in Nancy, in Lille, in Caen, of course, in Luxembourg. So please come and uh, hear this music and see this show uh, we have prepared with Francesca Latuada. Uh, I think it, it's worth it. Um, to conclude, um, I just would like to tell you that we are preparing a, a project with the Louvre with Ambronnet and uh, with the University of Sorbonne. Uh, this is a MOOC uh, we will uh, publish next um, October, uh, a MOOC about, about French musical life uh, in the 17th century with seven uh, episodes with more than three hours of videos, uh, with a lot of sound of explanation of images and with the idea that everyone who is interested in history, in sociology, in architecture, uh, and of course in music, can be interested in, in, this, uh, in this MOOC and can follow this project. So no need to be a specialist. Um, you can sus subscribe on our website from uh, next September. So thanks to all of you uh, for following me for these three talks uh, in Burgundy uh, about French Baroque music. And I really hope to see you um, uh, for a concert live uh, in the next few months. Thank you.